Hi everyone and welcome to Vintage Digitals. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to share with you this great Facebook group that I've been looking at for the past two months and it's called Vintage Digital Watches, no relation to my channel, it was there before I created my channel and it's administered by Isiman Tequila, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, it's a great group. Uh, there are loads of collectors. If you have questions, it's highly likely that somebody can answer them. People showcase their collections, their pickups. There is some buying and selling going on as well. So do, do check it out. Uh, it's great. Now today's episode is special because we are finally reviewing my Holy Grail watch, the Epson RC20. And I've been waiting a lot of time to do this. We are going to talk about the watch's history a bit, take a look at a few shots. Uh, go through the features, do a small disassembly at the end and uh, right 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 at the end uh, I'm going to tell you the story of how I managed to get hold of both models. So that's an interesting story. Stay tuned, but right now we are going to go on with the review. Being the same company, Seiko and Epson released their most powerful wrist terminal, the RC20, under the Epson brand around 1985. And this is because at that time Epson had the name not only in printers, but a huge name in computers as well. Seiko already had a different line of computer watches under their names Data 2000, UC and RC series like the RC4500 for example, with the most notorious being the Seiko Data series with its two types of keyboard terminals and basic capabilities. I reviewed one of those and if you want to check it out, it's in my videos. The RC20 was released in two color schemes one with white case, white band and grey bezel and the other was an all black bezel case and band. The square boxy appearance gave it a futuristic look and the writing on the side sets the stage for high technology, wrist computer. Both had plastic casing, plastic strap and a stainless steel back held together with four screws. The strap was a sliding type so it had no spring bars like you would see in most watches. And you can also find this sliding type in today's Casio film watch series. Most original straps haven't survived as the plastic rubble would crumble over time due to exposure to the elements and oil on the skin. Besides the little slide door that protects the serial interface, there are no moving parts on the watch and its clean look make it very fashionable even today. Hardware-wise, the RC20 had the most computing power out of the Seiko line at that time, sporting an SMC84C00 8-bit Z80 microprocessor. This was a clone of the popular Zyglo Z80 series 8-bit CPUs. It had 8 kilobytes of ROM and 2 kilobytes of RAM, and this 2 kilobytes of RAM meant that your program could be 2 kilobytes in size, 1,856 bytes to be exact. What also set it apart from other wrist computers is that it had a touch screen. But not a capacitive screen like we have in our devices today. It was a resistive screen with 18 areas that could be used for your program and further 5 areas at the bottom that are used to cycle and set the watch functions. Now there were other hardware accessories available for the RC20 like the ROM loader which allowed you to transfer programs that were burned into ROM memories down to the RC20. Connecting it to a computer was also possible, but the level shifter was needed if you want to get data off of the RC20. In the other direction, computer to RC20, you wouldn't need a level shifter. So here we are with the watch, we are going to do a quick disassembly, but uh, first of all we're going to talk about programming the watch and to be able to program the watch you will need the programming book titled Risk Computer 100% Utilization Method and this is a translation uh, that I've done from uh, Japanese. I will leave in the links below exactly the title of the book. It's by Hiroshi Okada um, and you would also need the appropriate cable and the appropriate computer and software. But the book describes all of these and uh, the book is as you would imagine from the middle of the 80s and the computers at that point were very primitive. Basically I tried to program the watch with a modern computer and correct compilers. From the book I managed to find out that you would need a hex file which then would be transferred down to the watch so you would have 
you would program the watch in uh, machine language. If you guys are familiar with that, then you know how tough that is. That would be uh, compiled into hex and that would be sent down through the serial interface. I couldn't do it with a normal PC. I tried multiple compilers, multiple PCs, multiple operating systems. What I ended up doing is purchasing one of these. So it's one of the computers from that era and it is described in the book that this computer can program the watch. And luckily with one of the watches, with the black one that came from Japan, there was also part of the book and actually quite the useful chapters where they describe the types of computers uh, that support this, uh, this watch. So you see QC10, this is one of the computers, HC408088. These are Epson computers and the one that I have is actually uh, one of these. Well, it's the PX4, but that counts as the HC40, I believe. And in the end, you can also see the cable. But I also have the complete book. This is not the complete book. It's just a photocopy of the original. And the complete book, I managed to source it through a contact in Japan. It took me about a year to find a person that was willing to look uh, in libraries for that book. Uh, and I'm still in the process of translating it. And hopefully I will manage to program one of the watches. Without further ado, we are going to do a quick disassembly um, of the watch. It has one of those, I believe it's the 2025 or 2030. Here we have a protector for the serial port contacts. As you can see, we have them there. We have multiple quartz. I imagine we need one for the processor, maybe one for timekeeping. It's very complex. So we can see that uh, the screen assembly is connected to the rest of the watch of the LCD with the LCD through a zebra strip that connects to the watch through the through this uh, lower recess that you see there, and we can now see the three by six matrix that you can use in programming and looking at the module we can see that it's very very complex we have a zebra strip there to connect the lcd and i'm sure you can see this these are two circuit boards sandwiched in between and there we can see we have one of those flex cables connecting them in between underneath we can expect to see uh, one of those z80 clones some other controllers, surely there is a separate one for the LCD and uh, other components. I'm not going to disassemble it further as I might damage the watch. I don't know if I open it up, if I damage that uh, flex cable that connects both of the PCBs. So this is as far as we can go with the disassembly. So during the assembly process, I did install a battery inside the watch. I apologize for my white ceiling that reflects in the watch. And it was a CR2320 that worked for me, but I believe this is a little bit too thin. 
uh, but it worked anyway. There is a version of this battery that is a little bit thicker. It has a different coat, but just so you know, the radius is that of the CR2320. As I did mention in the video, this is a hard watch to come by, very rare. Uh, I got lucky enough to source this too, um, but it wasn't easy. The first times I tried to bid on it on eBay, where I think it's one every three years or so, I couldn't get it, the price was too high. So I did a Google image search and used Japanese terms and found a blog where a guy was uh, going through the history of the smartwatch, uh, starting with the Seiko, uh, going on to the Epson RC20 and then finally going up to uh, the iWatch. And he had this watch and the shots in his pictures uh, were very... Um, not that popular on the image search, so they were uh, very isolated to his website. And I assumed that the watch was in his possession, wrote him an email, made him an offer. I did end up paying a premium for it, but I got it. Now, two months later, I was browsing Yahoo Auction Japan, looking at watches, and I said, hmm, why don't I search for Epson RC20? And this guy popped up and it cost 980 yen. Now, if you convert that, it's not even $10. So, in my mind, I said, okay, yeah, this is going to end up in the hundreds of, the hundreds of dollars. But it didn't. I was the only bidder. I ended up paying $50 because I paid for the quickest shipping possible, EMS five-day delivery, and four days later, it was in my hands. So, it was $50, but that's the watch and including shipping, and the shipping was uh, most of that price so I was very happy and the guy also it, it was a big box and the guy included even a uh, part of the manual which I'm in the process of translating and he did had a makeshift cable but I don't think that was the original cable it, it looked like it was uh, homemade or something so this gives you an impression of how hard these watches are to come by I do have an, uh, an eBay search for Epson RC20 None turned up in the past year and uh, occasionally I do look up on Yahoo Auction Japan just to check it out if another one shows up. Uh, it didn't. Now, don't be discouraged. Be consistent with your searches, also with your Google searches and you will get luck. That's it for the Epson RC20 review. Hopefully in the future I will make another video where I would have successfully managed to program it, but that is a long shot because that book is so tough to translate. Thanks for watching, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, if you didn't enjoy it, give it a thumbs up. Uh, make sure to subscribe and do check out that forum that I mentioned in the beginning, it's a goldmine of information. Until next time, don't forget to wear your vintage digital watches.